GM, GM, welcome to another episode of Web3 Academy. Today on the show, super excited to have Mo El Said from Ledger to talk all about wallets, hardware wallets, Web3 education, culture, art, so many things that we're going to be breaking down. Mo, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be diving into all of these interesting topics with you guys. We've got to make a note to the fact that you're calling from in from Paris at the Ledger head office. You had to fight for a meeting room because you've got, yeah. you've got so many people in the office these days. I actually got kicked out of the meeting room, so now I'm in a wonderful booth with a very nice fan. I hope you have fun for it. But, uh, but yeah, excited to be here. Let's start with the origin story of Ledger and maybe why you guys have decided to focus on hardware wallets, how that connects with your mission and your beliefs, the foundation of what you're focused on building at Ledger. That's a very interesting question. How much time do you have? The story of Ledger. <laughs> so Ledger is a French company. Most people mistake it for an you know, American company. It was actually born in Paris, 2014. Wow. Old company, at least from uh, relative to the space and where we are today, Ledger is kind of an OG company. So, so it was started before Ethereum and all that. So it was just a Bitcoin, or a Bitcoin wallet previously. Yeah, Interesting. Exactly. It's funny because I was just chatting with one of the co-founders of the company the other day for a separate project. And I was getting a little bit of insights from the beginning of, of the Ledger days. And um, so, you know, Ledger is born out of the idea that you need to actually secure private keys in an offline environment. And we probably get a little bit more into why it's important in the first place, but it's born out of the actual idea of putting private keys on a secure admin chip. And those secure admin chips are actually the chips that you can find in your biometric passports or credit cards. There is this uh, person uh, that I mentioned is Nicolas Bacat. He actually is the person who invented that private keys on a secure admin chip. His company was called BTC Chip back in the day. And, you know, eventually he ended up meeting the other Ledger co-founders in a place here in Paris that doesn't exist anymore, but used to exist back in the day. It was called La Maison du Bitcoin. And La Maison du Bitcoin was a physical space in which different Bitcoin fans would go up and meet. It had absolutely no business model at all. It was just, you know, born out of the love for Bitcoin and digital assets. And they met there and they kind of realized the fact that people they didn't necessarily have the ability to buy Bitcoin easily. So they came up with this Bitcoin ATM machine idea where you put in fiat, buy fiat, the actual machine would generate the private keys for you, put it on a chip in a card. So like kind of like a credit card, generate the private keys for you, put your Bitcoin on the chip. The, obviously it didn't have access to your private keys. It would generate it and forget it. I'm not going to get into the technicalities. By magic, you'd be able to buy Bitcoin, get a card. The card actually has your private keys on it and it has your Bitcoin. And then at some point they kind of realized that they had to scale this and that there was a huge need for the ability to not only to generate your keys and have Bitcoin on a card, but actually to be able to create multiple accounts using those keys and to be able to expand the different use cases by actually owning those keys and interacting with the blockchain. So that's how it started. That was like in, in 2014, obviously the first flagship, I would say product was the Nano S in 2016. And from that, we went to the Nano X and Ledger Live. So Ledger Live is the companion app that comes with your Ledger device. It's an interface that enables you to manage your uh, different digital assets, send, receive, lend, stake. And now it enables you also to access a wide variety of crypto services, such as EFI, um, apps and apps and NFT marketplaces, etc. So it became some sort of an ecosystem that started developing in 2019. 2020 was Ledger Nano S Plus and, you know, the addition of Ledger Market. Obviously, within that time frame, we started doing the what we call Ledger Vault. So it's not only focused on individuals that are securing their digital assets, but also corporations. To answer your question, why is this really a, a core mission? It's mainly because we're moving from the Internet of Information to the Internet of Value. And the Internet of Information required certain type of hardware, but we truly believe that Web2 hardware cannot protect Web3 value, meaning that your internet connected device, it's funny, right? It's the internet of information. It's an internet connected device that's designed to share information. That's why you can <laughs> log into Google with Facebook and you can log into Uber with Google and you can log into, it's all like interconnected, right? And you're actually, if you're using your internet connected device, your Web2 hardware, I'll, I'll just refer to it as Web2 hardware, for the purpose of securing your private keys, you're actually putting a secret on a device that's actually designed to share information. So it's, 
there's a dichotomy mm -hmm. and that results in a variety of different problems that we could see in the space. So Ledger's core mission is to provide individuals and corporations with the ability to own their assets and to own them in a way that's fully secure and that doesn't compromise on their ease of use and accessibility. So ownership, it's security, but it's also ease of use and accessibility. And that's what we've been trying to do as much as we can with the additional components that were added into the ecosystem, Ledger Live, Market, etc. Hope that wasn't too long of an answer. <laughs> Very interesting. So your guys kind of sort of thoughts here, your mission is that with these new iterations to the internet, with the features that we're adding to the internet with Web3, digital ownership being that main thing or self-custody, I guess, you're saying that like, the architecture of the internet or the hardware of the internet that we had for all that just actually doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And so we needed to build something else. And that's sort of the reason why Ledger exists today. Yep. I mean, you'd have to redesign from the ground up if you wanted the smartphone to actually protect your private keys. And then there are a few attempts at that, but it's very, very hard because you'd have to actually rethink the whole thing. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we've partnered with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. Shared ownership is revolutionizing the way we think of digital ownership. Did you know that you can benefit from the utility of a Board Ape Yacht Club, CryptoPunk, or Azuki without actually spending tens of thousands of dollars to buy it? How? By buying an access key to the asset. You see, with Segment, you can now buy and hold parts of an expensive NFT and share in its ownership and utility, like airdrops or exclusive access. As an owner of a high-profile NFT, you can distribute ownership with access keys and create liquidity for yourself. It's a win-win situation. Plus, the ownership and transfer of these keys are managed on-chain, which ensures transparency and security. Now, we want the Web3 Academy community to be on the forefront of this new wave of NFT utility, which is why we partner with Segment, a non-custodial NFT platform set to launch in Q3 of this year. Segment aims to allow users to easily create access keys and share ownership of NFTs with other friends and community members. The team is going through their beta release soon and has opened up their waitlist for Web3 Academy listeners. If you want to stay on the forefront of Web3, sign up for Segment's waitlist today with the link in the show notes below. Shared ownership is a game changer and we want you to be there first. Was Ledger the first hardware wallet? I imagine 2014, there wasn't many others at the time. No, I think that BTC chip was probably the first in terms of like putting the private keys on a, on a secure element chip. I think that stuck with be the first attempt at that. And then that gave birth to Ledger afterwards. So, And so outside of just becoming like a, a wallet, which I think is what most people think of Ledger right now, you can see that you guys are really building out so much more. You called it a bit of an ecosystem, I guess, Ledger mm -hmm. ecosystem. I'm wondering if you can just paint a further picture of that. Like you kind of touched on it, but maybe give us more details of just like what Ledger's thinking there and like what that means to go and build out more of an ecosystem and how that relates to your to your overall mission, I guess. Yeah, 100%. That's a great question. You know, if you look at like the different things that a corporation or even an individual need to do in order to be able to safely navigate the space, there are a variety of different steps there. First one is to create your keys and store them securely, obviously the hardware. Second one is to transact on the blockchain securely. Ledger, you know, automatically, if you own a ledger and you store your keys and generate and store your keys on a ledger, you're basically protected from malware and hacks. Because if you end up by mistake downloading a malware on your computer, your keys are not on your computer. Any transaction that's actually initiated using your internet connected device will have to be verified and physically confirmed using your device. So you're hack proof in some sense. But when you're transacting on the blockchain, you're actually signing all the time. So Ledger protects you from a hack. It doesn't automatically protect you from a mistake. If you end up signing a transaction or 
if you end up giving getting fished and giving your seed phrase away, your assets will still get taken away from you. So the idea of building an ecosystem, so starting with Ledger Live, obviously, but then, you know, our new product Stacks also has a screen today that's much wider, obviously is going to be equipped with technology that enables you to verify where you're signing in a much more effective way. And I'll get into that in a second. Uh, the second step is mainly transacting on the blockchain and understanding what you're signing. So despite the fact that your keys are secured and you're secure on your ledger and protected by the secure element, et cetera, if you end up signing a malicious transaction, you will end up losing your assets. So you need to understand where you're signing. And a big problem today that we have in the space is blind sign. When you actually use your ledger device or even just use a software only solution to interact with a smart contract, the actual interface that you're using is not equipped with the plugins that would enable it to translate smart contract data, hex data into human readable language. So for us to be able to secure your Web3 journey, we also needed to address that second point, which is that when you're interacting with a smart contract, you need to understand what you're signing and we need to provide you with the information that would enable you to understand what you're signing and sign it, you know, or not sign it based on that. <laughs> to be clear, what you're speaking of, I guess, is the point at which you go to sign a transaction. Let's say you're using a ledger or a MetaMask or whatever it is you're using. There's a little message and it says like kind of what you're signing. Oftentimes that message is like, X, 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 X. And I'm like, what the heck is this? What's going on here, right? Or like it says something, but it's so general. You're like, I don't really understand what I'm signing here. I'm pretty sure it's legit, but I don't really know. That's what you're referring to is you guys can basically, it's the wallet that controls the UX of that. It's the wallet that controls what that's actually saying. Yeah. So it depends on what kind of interface you're using. So for instance, to get back to Ledger Live, Ledger plus Ledger Live is actually completely designed for clear signing only. Meaning that if we integrated the app on Ledger Live, we work with the developers of, you know, the partners, developers in order to put in place the plugins that would enable the translation of the smart contract data to be done automatically and then the information to be transmitted to your device's screen. So for instance, if I were to be signing a malicious transaction that would be taking, a, you know, my board ape away from me, if I was doing that on Ledger Live, I would see the fact that a board ape would be the traveling mm -hmm. on. Ah, I'm sure Whereas, I'm sure. uh, if, if you were doing that on another interface, most of the time, what's actually connecting you with smart contract is not your ledger. It's the middleware that you're using. So the middleware could be used as a software wallet or only solution as well. But if your keys are protected by your ledger, you connect your ledger to the software, whether it be MetaMask or, or Wallet Connect or Phantom or Temple, depending on which blockchain you're using. And obviously, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to work with all of these middlewares with the technology that's currently available to us in order to provide clear signing on there as well. But starting with Ledger Live, Ledger Live is clear signing only. And then working with the different partners in the ecosystem, we're trying to implement solutions in order to provide clear signing using their middlewares as well for the Ledger users. And then beyond that, we're also developing our own extension, which is called Ledger Extension. And the added value to that is not only the clear signing bit, because clear signing is based on what you're going to see on the screen of the device at the moment of signature. Ledger extension will provide you with a web three check, meaning that aside from the clear signature, if you connect to certain app for the first time, it will actually give you certain data points that will enable you to decide whether this is something safe or not. If you're connecting or interacting with the smart contract for the first time, It'll tell you that you're interacting with it for the first time. It'll tell you how much value was transacted using that smart contract. It will tell you whether it was flagged by uh, for malicious activity. So before signature moment, you're getting a scan of the different stuff that you're interacting with on the blockchain. That's kind of like the second step, which is obviously transacting on the blockchain. It's not only about the security of your keys. It's about the information that's given to you or that's available to you at the moment. Mm -hmm action and that would keep you away from falling into pitfalls or getting scammed in a more general sense. The third part is about for creators and corporations, which is deploying your assets securely. Corporations would go through the first two steps either ways, you know, they have to create their keys, secure them, transact on the blockchain in order to buy and sell digital assets. At a certain point, they will also, as a creator or a corporation, you would also be interested in, you know, deploying a contract and distributing digital assets. And this is where Ledger Market comes in, where, you know, the idea is to provide a gateway on point fifth and point four corporations that have never entered the space or are about to enter the space to be able to do it securely. And then on top of that, once you start generating revenue, you have to manage your treasury 
And this is where Ledger Enterprise Solutions come in. The thing is that if you actually run a whole company's treasury on one single ledger, you have a big friction point there, which is the governance. Mm-hmm. Who do you give the ledger to? Who secures your seed phrase? Oh, what if your goes rogue? What if your accountant doesn't answer his phone anymore? There's, you know, <laughs> things that you could go through. So these are like the four different pillars that ledger is currently addressing. It sounds like the goal of ledger is to become the UX of Web3. If you want to interact with Web3, do it with ledger because ledger has each type of wallet all the way through each way to interact with everything you can do on the, in Web3. And it's like you're trying to do it in the safest, most secure way possible. And essentially, you're the front end UX of it all, actually, and the hardware. Before you answer that, when you said deploy contracts for businesses and creators, you mean like launching NFT or minting ERC-20s or something? Yeah. Okay. Let's say you're a brand and the NFT space is interesting to you. You want to expand your product line and start launching you know, NFTs as collectibles or membership tokens or whatever. You actually don't have the internal resources for you to be able to do that securely on your own. We don't provide strategic advice on how to best launch your NFT project from a price point or community <laughs> template. It's just the infrastructure that is needed for you to be able to do it securely. That's what we provide. It's all about security and it's all about securing as an individual or a community or a corporation your journey in the Web3 space. And I like that you're approaching it from the different stakeholders that we have in the space. So you mentioned the users being safe and the potential that they're facing. You mentioned the platforms or the softwares that we all have to interact with. And then you mentioned the creators and corporations, whether that be one stakeholder or two different stakeholders, sometimes you can separate those in two because large corporations are different than small business creators, but same idea. So viewing it from those different stakeholders. And I know you mentioned Stacks and we definitely want to talk about Stacks because we're all super excited about that. But before we talk about Stacks, I just would love to just briefly talk about the user stakeholder a little bit more because I think that's where so many people are struggling right now. And so I'm just curious, let's say you're out at a dinner party and you're talking to somebody, a friend of yours or somebody you've met recently What's your advice to them as a user to interact safely in the wallet? Or actually, maybe let's back up. How do you explain a wallet to them? How do you explain wallet UX to somebody new? It it really depends where their level of knowledge is. What I usually try to do is to draw as many parallels as possible with the traditional financial world, because that's what everyone gets. And to try and, you know, identify where TransFi falls short and how Web3 and DeFi can help solve some of these frictions. So if you look at it, the way I see it is that the banking system is is so limiting. And a lot of people don't understand the fact that you don't really own your money. I'm half Egyptian. I grew up in Egypt during the Egyptian revolution. And I can tell you that, you know, when you have a whole banking system and financial system being completely shut down, you kind of realize that you can't withdraw more than X amount or you can't transfer more than, than Y amount. And it's crazy because, you know, you kind of have that frustrating feeling. This is my money. I've earned it and I can't spend it. So... Understanding this is key. And once you understand this, you understand that you are actually trusting the third party with your money and you don't really have a choice. Like, I don't know how it's like in Canada, but if you walk up to a bank in France here today and you ask them to withdraw 100,000 euros, I can guarantee you that you're not going to be able to walk away with the bank with a bag full of cash, even if this is your money. Yeah. So understanding this is key. And then once you understand that you're trusting a third party without necessarily having the choice, you just have the choice in between like which third party do you want to trust more than the others, whether it be your fintech applications or your traditional bank. You kind of understand that everything is based on your physical identity and that the only way for you to get access to those funds is to prove to the bank that you are you and for you as a person to be in the guardrails or in the framework that is designed for you as a citizen within those countries. So as as soon as you get outside of these like borders and rules that are defined for you, you'll be, you know, deprived away from getting access to your finances. This is the situation of ChatFi, but then when you start looking at like blockchain technology and what it solves, the way I see it is that blockchain is a bank that's open 24 seven. It doesn't care where you're coming from, who you are, what you do in real life, whether it's the weekend or Monday morning, (laughs) it's all the same. The only thing it cares about is who owns the blockchain account that was created. And when you create a blockchain account, anyone with an internet connection can do so. You basically have to just 
create a wallet first, whether it be, you know, software or hardware, and we can get into that. But once you do create a blockchain account using wallet, there are two set of keys that are generated. The private key and the public key. So your public key is kind of like your IBAN or email address. You can use it to provide it to, you know, anyone who wants to be sending assets over to you. Whereas your private key is more like your identity, your way to actually prove that you are you. You're, if you take the example of a mailbox, it's the key that actually opens that, that mailbox. So understanding that your private key is the way for you to prove to that decentralized 24-7 open bank that you are the individual that owns this account is the first step into understanding the whole notion of self-custody and the importance of securing those set of keys. That's where, you know, you start talking and you can, you know, start getting into wallets and the different ways that are available to you in terms of like generating and securing those keys. But the key is your, you know, on-chain identity and it really opens up the limitless possibilities that would be available to you in the world of, of, of blockchain and Web3. So that's how I usually get into it. <laughs> you just said it opens up the world to so much more. And I was going to ask that because you talked a lot about the money side of it, which is the way that yeah. many of us got into the space and obviously was the first use case of blockchain. But the way I see it, and at least what we teach on our show a lot, is that there's so much more to this whole world, to Web3, than just money, right? I think there's identity, there's your social reputation, there's your content. You mentioned a lot about creators and how they're going to be making NFTs and things that might not be financial assets. They might be more, I mean, everything kind of is a financial asset in the space as boils down to it. But like, ultimately it's like something to access community, things that you like and you collect and they're not worth anything to anyone, but they're yours. And ultimately those all go in your wallet too. They go in the same thing that helps you access this 24 hour bank. So I'm just curious how Ledger thinks through that. Is that something that's like on your mind and you're building for as well? Or are you guys focused mainly on DeFi and just like securing your money? No, 100%. I mean, at the end of the day, that's why I use the analogy of your identity is your key because your identity is everything that you own at the end of the day. It's what makes you, you. <laughs> it's really like, a, you know, whatever you own in terms of like financial assets, but also the cultural assets that you own, but also your identity, but also your on-chain certifications, but also your credentials. And it's the combination of all of that that creates your on-chain identity. Understanding this very early on, at least in the way we're developing our product, we're trying to integrate as many functionalities into the ecosystem that will enable you to explore all of these different avenues and also provide the platform for the future, for future use cases. We're really still at the nascent phase in terms of different things that you can do with your wallet. But if you think about like being able to own all of that independently from a third party is such an amazing invention. And then being able to interact with different technologies or with different interfaces at once using one single device to do all of that is also something that people don't realize how much is going to impact society in a more general sense, right? If you think about like your physical wallet today, it has a lot of like these different components into it. Like you have your gym membership card and, and you have your credit card and you have your driver's license, yeah. all of that. But what it doesn't have is it doesn't have your art collection. It doesn't have your gaming assets. It doesn't have your pictures and your social media accounts and event tickets and all of that. So it's actually taking the base layer of what a physical wallet has and adding on top of it all of the elements that are actually only available to you in the digital world. The biggest difference now is that the way what the internet was currently currently is and was developed in the past doesn't actually enable you to own whatever you have digitally. So now you're actually able to own it digitally on top of everything that you have in the physical world. That's like such an interesting way to think about it because once you have that in mind, then you can start imagining all of the future use cases that will be available to everyone that owns a wallet in the future. So crypto wallet. So that begs the question, is wallet the right term for these things? When I think of this as like, yes, there's a wallet and that was the main use case up until like 2020. But now it's like, as you said, this is also now my new accounts, right? Like I have an account on Instagram, I have one on Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Now it's all in one, right? Like my Lens account and my, I don't know, Farcaster account are both on my one wallet now. Yep. That's a big change from the Web2 world. And so it's an account, it's a profile. It's where people can like find information about me. It's like my LinkedIn, right? I guess that's a profile as well because I got my credentials in there. It gets so much more than a wallet. So do we yeah. stick with that word or do you think that changes into something else? I like to call it the ledger. 
Makes sense. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Are you a marketer too? I am a marketer, but actually when you think about it, this ledger is a book in which you can write everything that you own. Your digital ledger, you know, if you think about what a ledger is in terms of like the different things that you can put in there, you can actually combine everything that we've spoken about. I had never thought about that. Me either. <laughs> That's it. That guys might be making that play. It's like how Kleenex is actually a brand, but we all call it Kleenex now. Right. Right. Yeah. Red no, no one yeah. goes up to a bar and says, hey, can you serve me an energy drink? Right, right. That's a good point. This begs a question to me. So when you guys launched Stacks, and for those who don't know what Stacks is, like this was their newest wallet or ledger, whatever we're going to call it. And all that <laughs> Belt tap screen. And when it first came out, it actually kind of looked like Jay and I said, well, it looks kind of like an iPhone. The question, the debate that Jay and I had when we covered this story was, are we going to walk around with an iPhone and a ledger stacks or a equivalent to it? Or does this replace the iPhone? Because like, why did my iPhone is my way that I go and interact with all of these accounts, my Instagram account, my Twitter account. It is the hardware that gives me the UX to do that. But if now my account's all on one piece of hardware, and I don't need any of that anymore. Why do I need the phone? So two questions here. Is that what you guys are thinking with this play? And two, who's your competitor? Obviously your competitor right now is MetaMask when we're th thinking a wallet. Is your competitor Apple? That's what I think your competitor is, but I'm just curious. I don't think that our competitor is Apple. I think that at the end of the day, to come back to what we were saying is that Ledger as a device today is meant to replace your physical wallet. You have two things in your pocket when you're walking around is that your smartphone and your physical wallet. As everything becomes more digitized, your passport will end up becoming a digital document. Your driving license will end up becoming a digital document. Your credit card is already a digital document. Like I use Apple Pay more than I use my physical credit card. So, so the idea is that we are trying to design the wallet for the digital world, the web tree world, the internet of value. And that would be designed specifically to work seamlessly with your smartphone because you're still going to need your smartphone and really great example on how that would work is obviously the partnership that we announced with Samsung a few weeks ago but you know to come back to Apple the creator of the stacks is the co-creator of the iPod and the iPhone Tony Fidel understanding exactly how you know hardware can impact behavior change impact the lives of millions of people around the world is really something that's deeply ingrained in the team that worked on stacks and their vision into how to design something that's easier to use and that really solves a, a lot of like different frictions in the user experience and what stacks is doing is really providing um, new entrants and also you know native web3 community with the ability to understand what they're signing in a much more seamless way. But not only that, the onboarding experience is so much more seamless. The ability to generate your seed and then note it down and getting back and verify it back into the devices, I would say orders of magnitude more seamless than how it is today. And then beyond that, it's just a device that will enable whatever culture is being developed in the Web3 space, whether it be art or different applications, to actually come to life through a device that's designed to interact with them. It's kind of also a first stepping stone into how your NFTs will come to life on a Ledger device or on a hardware wallet in a more generous sense, right? And Ledger Live is also being redesigned for, for specific purposes and more apps will be available that will only be exclusive on stacks. We have, you know, NFT drops that will be exclusive to Ledger Stacks holders. So we call the art and stacks. We collaborating with a variety of different generative artists. So it's kind of taking the preconceived idea of hardware device being something that's super technical. It's a cold wallet, it's a cold storage. You, you're not meant to be using it on a daily basis. It's super complicated, it's clunky, etc. That's how I would say most new entrants perceive hardware wallets today to something that they actually want to own, that's easy to use, that they want to be using on a daily basis, that they want to be putting their favorite NFTs on, that they want to be interacting with their favorite D apps with. And on top of that, it's actually pretty cool when you have it in your hand, it's like stackable. You can stack many of them on top of one another, you can name them. So all of these are like many features that enable people to understand the value of owning a ledger device, but also feel emotional connection to having a device that's actually nice to use. Like I get the idea that you guys are kind of reinventing the wallet. So let's get rid of the old analog wallet and let's have a digital wallet that's touch screen or whatever like that makes it so obvious that that's the way that we would go. I think anyone can understand that. Though I do, I want to go back to this idea of like, 
competing with Apple. And the reason I say that is like, one, I remember when reading a book that Steve Jobs was talking about when they were making the iPhone was basically saying like, we are competing with other things that are put in people's wallets. We're competing with MP3 players. We're competing with our own iPod. Uh, and I don't even remember what the other devices we used to put in our pocket at the time. He's like, that's what we're competing with. People only have so much room in their pocket, right? So like, okay, we have room for a phone. We have room for a stack. So that makes complete sense. But like, as we said, everything is going to be happening in Web3. We're going to start socializing with Web3. Like, let's say we use Lens or we use whatever. We're going to start to do those things. We interact with our banks through Web3. We interact with a lot of, like you said, credentials and tickets and all these things. Web3, okay, so that's all going to be on stacks. All you need to do is put a phone in there. What's the point in having two pieces of hardware? Like, Or it goes the other way and Apple all of a sudden creates a hardware that allows you to store digital. Are you guys not doing or maybe you're not thinking about that because we need to make sure self-custody and security is first. So we need to separate it from the thing that we're playing around with and just using like all the time. Is that the idea of keeping them separate or like do you guys picture them eventually merging? I think they will merge eventually, but we're far away from it. Right. Right. It's easier said than done. You know, Apple would have done it. Samsung would have done it. They tried. Or a variety of different, you know, examples in which this actually came to life. But it's really not as safe as how it should be. And trying to put a secure element on a phone and, and basically all the wallet functionality is running on a phone basically requires you to rethink the design of the phone using the ground. Right. So it's very hard. Like imagine most of these phone manufacturers would have to either create a separate line of products that would only be focused on hardware wallets. That would be so much easier for them than trying to integrate a wallet into their phone. The real overlap here today is what we've done with Samsung, what we're going to be aiming to do with other phone manufacturers in the future is providing a seamless experience for the two of them to work together, despite the fact that they're still two separate devices. And Can then you talk about that a bit more, what that means? Like maybe you want to talk further about that partnership or just like how they're going to interact more closely? Yeah. So I think interacting more closely comes through a variety of like different avenues, right? There's obviously the ability for Ledger Live to be automatically downloaded into certain phones and for you to be able to buy a bundle of a phone with a Ledger and for the whole overall experience to actually have been designed, tested for the two of them to work seamlessly without any bugs and for actually the different implementations that will be going on in the future to start adding value to that user experience in terms of like security features, additional features that you'd be able to get. And then, you know, beyond that, there's also the ability for these phone providers to work with Ledger's ecosystem in general in order to provide their own uh, consumers with a lot more than just the hardware, with the ability to, you know, tap into Ledger market for certain drops or get certain perks and when interacting with a, you know, market or quest or a variety of different things so that they're able to enable their current consumers to step into the world of Web3 securely. And then at the end of the day, it's kind of growing the value of their ecosystem while the value of, of Ledger's ecosystem grows as well. I think that definitely makes sense in terms of like the next steps onto the evolution of Web2 and Web3 hardwares. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, if they do merge someday or another, they will merge out of a partnership between two manufacturers rather than one eating up the other as by sheer innovation and, you know, research and development capabilities. It really is a result of the fact that, as you said, blockchain is so different. So building hardware for blockchain requires ground up thinking, not to mention the amount of time it takes to develop and create hardware, right? Yeah, I think sometimes it's easy for us to sit here because new software wallet features are launching all the time and we're like come on ledger why is there not a phone already come on so like it does take that time but you're pursuing the unbundling of the hardware web2 bundled everything for us and it did it in an incredible way where all of a sudden we could do so much on our phone but in a lot of ways it went too far because it sacrificed security and it sacrificed privacy and so we need to unbundle the tech side, the hard love the shines and the terms. That's actually how the evolution of the internet is. It's always like an unbundling and a rebundling right. and a bundling and a rebundling. That's, you know, continuous cycle that we've seen with web one, web two, and now with web three as well. Unbundling and rebundling will happen in web three. I don't think we're there yet, but, but it will happen. I hope that when it does happen, it happens in a way that, you know, at least ledger on, on our end, I can guarantee that there will be no compromise on digital sovereignty and security, because if we compromise on that core value proposition, then we kind of end up in a web 2.5 world and 
The Web 2.5 world is interesting for now because it enables a lot of people to get into the space, but we have seen the shortcomings of Web 2.5, namely FTX, for instance. Right. Well, that's the thing is that the entire point, the feature that Web 3 gives us is self-custody. And so like then all of a sudden we built a bunch of things that just ignore that feature. The only point in all of this is self-custody. And so like even if self-custody has a way worse UX than not self-custody, that's still much better because that's what we need for all the reasons like you just talked about growing up in Egypt. Right. The whole point in this thing is self-custody. So the moment you get away from it, it's no longer Web3 and it, it's useless. We already have good UX of non-self-custody stuff. And so the focus now is let's go and build the ability to self-custody, whether that's great UX or not. Like I think Ledger is, is kind of getting us to that place. But ultimately, if it's not self-custody, there is no point. It's just Web2. So when we talk about unbundling and bundling, when we look at it from the software side, how will apps work on stacks? Will there be an app marketplace? Will new creators be able to create apps on stacks and bundle self-custody and decentralized apps into stacks? Walk us through that. So, you know, eventually the goal is that definitely, but that won't be available from the get-go. The first thing is that stacks is obviously compatible with Ledger Live. Ledger Live is still running on your internet connected device, so Web2 hardware, phone, laptop. But there will be apps that will be created on Ledger Live that will have specific stacks features that wouldn't be available on the nanos, for instance. You'll start thinking about different D apps being developed on Ledger Lives for specific stacks purposes. And that's very exciting. You know, if you look at the art on stacks project, it's actually um variety of different generative artists that are building generators to create outputs. And these outputs will be going through resizing type of software that would resize them automatically for your ledger stacks screen. So we'll be putting in place a variety of different tools for creators to be able to optimize their different artworks for the stack screen. And then you can start imagining like a variety of different other tools for such specific stacks use cases. You know, the further we go, the further we will try as much as we can to have stacks as the platform. Like I think long-term goal is definitely for the device itself to host all of the applications. Right, right. You mentioned art, and I know that you're a passionate NFT collector, and I think you lead the Ledger NFT collection as well, I believe, as part of your role. Why do you think art is such a great onboarding ramp or a vector for Web3 adoption? The answer to that is quite simple. Like how many people around you are interested in finance and how many of them are interested in culture? I think finance definitely has a lot of weight in terms of like the adoption of the space and, and the value that, that's being created. And that obviously is what's driving the space is, is finance. But I think the interest from mainstream and the interest from people like me and I suppose you guys as well is culture. Like we live on culture. It's uh, the music you listen to, the art that you have on your wall, the games that you play, the connections that you make. It's all built around culture. And I think at the end of the day, any technology in the past, at least, was adopted thanks to culture. Like if you think about even the best devices that were ever, Apple, we were talking about Apple, like Apple wasn't talking about bits and processing power and, and <laughs> memory support, which Microsoft was. Apple was telling you a thousand songs in your pocket, or it was, you know, telling you things that it resonated emotionally, you know, around creativity and around what we stand for, what, you know, the community stands for. And, you know, that's how technologies get adopted is that they tend to be used in cultural contexts in which a variety of different people actually interact with the technology in order to create outputs that have an impact on much larger cohorts of people. I think that when I come back to your question, like in, in terms of like what we do at Ledger is that we're collecting NFTs. So I'm a deputy curator of the Ledger collection alongside a whole community. And I think that as a security company, a lot of people don't understand that, like, you know, why the hell would you collect art or why the hell we connect these? And I think what's really obvious to us today is that if we're able to use, you know, the brand as a platform in order to, first of all, support different creators, bring them more visibility, and then become an active member in the development of this cultural ecosystem that's currently being built out in Web3, it's actually net positive for the overall ecosystem. And we're trying as much as we can to expand the borders of the space through culture. And if you even look at like the different collabs that we've done with our device, you know, we've 
collaborated with a ton of different brands from Fendi to Kublo to YG as a, some of the creators or Sweetie or, or other creators that we worked with to design custom hardware. That really is another kind of stepping stone towards trying to turn something that is intimidating, that is considered to be too technish, to kind of uh, not, not for the mainstream uh, use to something that's interesting and could be widely adopted by, you know, mainstream cultures. <laughs> I'm curious to get to, I want to go back to the UX side of things for a second, because as we just said, like culture is going to play such a big role here with Web3 and we're going to do so much more than just finances. And I think the existing UX of like everything you're going to do, you need to sign a transaction makes sense if it was just finances. But like you just said, everything's going to go on chain from the way we socialize, the way that we even probably communicate, the way we collect art. It probably doesn't make sense to me that we're going to sign a transaction for every single interaction we do on Web3. I'm curious what Ledger is thinking about that. We also have Argent coming on who is building a wallet for account abstraction, right? And so CK Proofs, they enable you to create wallets that you know you don't have to sign transactions. It's all kind of like the blockchain side of things are just like hidden. And I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on kind of where this all goes. Is account abstraction something you guys are thinking about? Or is there a different type of UX or a different idea you guys have of how we'll kind of interact with Web3? I think, you know, interactions with Web3 at the end of the day will happen across all of these different solutions that are available to us. So you still have the EOAs, externally owned accounts, basically Ledger is one. And then you're going to have a variety of different ERC4337 uh, types of accounts, so account of abstraction or smart wallet. The core of the security of all of your accounts is going to be held by your cold wallet, your ledger at the end of the day, and your, it's going to be a cold account. I might have to specify a little bit more what I mean by that, because most people mistake hardware wallets for being solely like cold wallets, but mm -hmm. in your hardware wallet, you can actually generate multiple different accounts. And the way I'd like to use the term cold account is the account that you actually never use in order to sign anything on chain. You're basically using it only to store your most valuable NFTs. And then you might have your warm wallet, you might have your mint wallet, your warm wallet might be used to verify your identity on the websites that you usually interact with on a you know, daily basis. Whereas your mint wallet is the wallet that you use in order to kind of explore those drops that I you think. Or, yeah, you know, we call it the YOLO wallet. So at the end of the... <laughs> the YOLO wallet, is that what he said? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, it's culture. That's culture. All of the security of those different accounts are actually independent from one another. If you sign a malicious transaction using your YOLO wallet, it won't impact your warm wallet. Your wallet. The only thing that would actually take away all of your assets at once is if you lose your seed phrase. So that you have to keep it secure, keep it offline. Take a picture of it. Don't take a picture of it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> take a Polaroid picture of it. <laughs> take a Polaroid picture of it. That's a much better idea. Don't take a picture of it. Don't share it with anyone. So anyway, to get back to your question is, what is going to be looking like in the future? Obviously, account abstraction is going to be a huge thing. But having the agency over your keys is still going to be useful because account abstraction is going to be a huge unlock for a variety of different use cases. Think about blockchain gaming, for instance, to come back to your example, you don't want to be signing a transaction each and every single time you're picking up an item from the floor, or selling an item to someone else. It would basically kill, you'd be signing transactions for the whole experience. So account abstraction will be very interesting there because you might be able to actually program your different accounts based on the use cases that you're going to be uh, utilizing them for. So basically, if you're playing a game, you might give it approval for three hours to approve all transactions using that specific account. And it could be your YOLO account. So that at the end of the day, doesn't host any valuable assets. You're basically programming an ERC4337 type of account for you to be able to interact with that game. But also, it will enable you to give a much more granular vision on how you're going to be utilizing these different accounts and how you're going to program them specifically for these use cases. So I think the future is basically a much more secure hardware, easy to use hardware combined with programmable accounts for a variety of different use cases. So for a lot of the like high activity things, applications like let's say social or gaming, account abstraction will exist instead of creating an account like we do in the Web2 world where that all your info is stored on that company's database, you'll just create a, an account abstracted smart wallet in there, do all the things you need to do for a great UX, if you happen to earn something, you win a championship, you get a bunch of money or something, you'll take that, send it from that wallet to your ledger, let's say, or your true cold wallet. And that's where you'll continue on with yeah. your journey of your self-sovereignty. 
100 percent. your abstracted accounts they can be created using your ledger in the future that that's definitely going to be a possibility as well so uh, you'll have a mix of different types of accounts that are controlled right. within the same interface okay i need to ask seed phrases is this the future are we going to continue to have seed phrases or does that go away so i don't know what it could be to something else social account recovery or whatever does this continue to be a thing that most users like is my mom going to have to figure out how to use a seed phrase at some point? i hope not for now the main focus is to actually enable different types of recovery of that seed phrase so in the future you know if you become really focused on that solving that issue of the seed phrase you can find a variety of different solutions but every single solution will have some sort of a drawback in terms of like giving a full ownership or partial ownership of the seed phrase to a third party figuring out how you can actually do so in a way or maybe you can give it to smart contract but then you're also prone to smart contract risks there are a variety of like different compromises that you need to do in order to solve that issue I think we're not the only ones to be working on solving the, the seed phrase issue. And I think you'll have a variety of different solutions that will be available to different people, depending on, on how they want to be approaching it. But when we look back in 10, 15 years and think about, you know, the day that you had to generate a, a seed phrase using your ledger wallet and then note it down on a piece of paper and then hide that piece of paper somewhere. And then whenever your wallet broke down or or anything happened, you have to take that piece of paper out and then put in 24 words and have to click on two buttons and stuff like that. Those are those are going to be our dial-up internet funny right. story in like a few years. But it's not as easy to solve because there will be compromises. Account abstraction is definitely a very interesting way to solve it. But for EOAs, there's definitely still going to be a need to solve this in a way that doesn't compromise on security. Awesome. One of the interesting things to me about Stacks is that a, that it stacks, and you guys chose the name that pushes this use case of stacking multiple ledgers together. Why such a focus on stacking multiple ledgers? How are you seeing your current users use Ledger, and what made you want to create something that could enable multiple wallets? And do you think that that's something long-term that we will have multiple wallets? Do you think eventually it'll only be one? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people use their ledgers for different purposes. So there are a variety of different approaches to this. You can have one ledger per asset type. So you can have a ledger for your Bitcoins, another for Ethereum, another for your NFTs, or you can have them all on one wallet and then have a variety of different accounts for each one of these. But I think the reality is that a lot of people actually tend to separate their assets using different seeds and different ledgers. And the solution to actually enabling them to identify which is which is by being able to actually name them. And actually, a lot of people name their ledgers and, and customize them and, and try to, you know, make it feel as personal as possible because, you know, a decent amount of people, they use their ledgers, at, you know, on a daily basis or at least on a weekly basis. So providing the ability to actually name your device and customize it and the magnet that stacking them on top of one another... Aside from it being pretty cool and, and the fact that you're playing around with them all the time, it actually enables you to put them all in one place and make sure that if you're putting it in your bag or whatever closet, etc., you, you can actually have them all stacked together. So from a user experience perspective, it's pretty fun. Most people are just putting tape on their ledgers right now and writing on the tape, right? And so I'm sure it's amazing how that UX is so simple. It seems so obvious that we should have a name that we can see on a ledger, but that was a simple thing that will make such a difference for so many of us when, yeah, as you said, we can now stack them all together and see, oh yeah, there's my Bitcoin one, there's my NFT, there's my whatever. My YOLO one. Yeah, there's my YOLO. <laughs> So I'm going to shill for you here. Everybody go order, pre-order your stack. <laughs> you can pre-order them right now. I believe they start shipping in April. Am I correct on that, Mo? Yeah, they they start shipping in, towards end of April, beginning of May. And the, the thing is that you know, Stacks is a little bit of a victim of its own success. We, we had to close down the pre-orders because the well, demand... can't you know, pre-order anymore. You can't okay. pre-order Stacks anymore. However, if you go to OpenSea, you can actually buy the Stacks on <laughs> secondary. And so I love this space. It's like, if it's filled, you can't order it, but then people are selling their order on OpenSea. Yeah, so exactly. So you can actually buy a, buy stacks on the secondary market. And if you do own the NFTs, you know, you'll be informed in which batch exactly where your ledger gets served. But we, we start shipping it 
end of April, beginning of May. What a great use case for NFTs, though, for inventories. I don't know, but Ledger could put a creator royalty on that if OpenSea allows it. And now you can create additional revenue of people trading your pre your pre-orders. That's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going on a ramble here. Yeah, but absolutely. I think being able to utilize NFTs for physical products and, you know, token redemption, token gated, sorry, um, services through the actual ownership of that, you know, NFT, if you think about like what could be unlocked in terms of like owning the stacks NFT and then being able to access a specific accessory because you have it or being able to access a specific, you know, service. Uh, that would only be available to the people that actually own the stacks NFT is definitely something that's super interesting. So we're, we're trying to explore that a little bit more with, with what's going to be happening with like Ledger Shop becoming a little bit more of a Web3 type of experience with token gated experiences, et cetera. So definitely looking forward to that as well. Do you guys think of what you're building with Ledger as like a new form of browser almost? Like I think of a browser as what allows me to go and interact with like Web2 apps or Web2 websites. And like kind of what you guys are building with Ledger is like, the thing that allows me to go and interact with Web3 or dApps, it's almost like a browser, but a little bit different. I guess it's the browser of value instead of a browser of information. I don't know, but is that something you guys see this as too? I've never thought of it this way, but it's definitely interesting. I would say it's more of a key that enables you to access right, okay. the browsers and the different interfaces. Uh, obviously, now with Ledger Extension and Ledger Live, you do have a little bit of that browser feeling, but you know, Ledger is mainly focused on being the secure gateway, but then, you know, at the end of the day, you can interact with a variety of different browsers and interfaces in order to do whatever it is that you want to be doing in the space. Okay. Before we wrap up, Mo, I know you've been working a lot on Ledger Quest and I want to give you a chance to tell the users a little bit about Ledger Quest because it's such an incredible tool for education. So many of our users are trying to learn about the space and this is definitely something that they should know about and be checking out. So tell us about it. Sure. You know, Ledger Quest is really an attempt at trying to make sure that Web3 education is part of the Web3 experience, right? Because if you think about it, a lot of people come into the space, and we were talking about that earlier, but if you come into the space for the first time, you're mostly coming in out of FOMO because some friend told you that you had to buy this NFT or you needed to act fast and do this and that. But most of the time, you know, education isn't really part of your priorities. You create an account, you buy the NFT, and then, you know, you start thinking about whatever it is that you need to be learning about in order to secure your assets. When you hear about a scam or a hack or God forbid you get hacked or scammed. Trying to make sure that people can get educated very early on while the experience Web3 is really, really important. You were talking about that before we started recording, but at Ledger, you know, we've built a whole educational ecosystem, starting with Ledger Academy, which is like our educational platform. It hosts, you know, a variety of different content formats. It covers a ton of topics. And it's really like the Web2 experience of Web3 education. So it's basically a website. You can listen to podcasts, watch videos, read articles, etc. But then when you think about it, it's a pretty passive type of experience and it's not really connected to Web3 yet. So what we're trying to do with Quest is that we're trying to bridge the two. So you'd be learning about a topic on Ledger Academy, let's say private key security. And then once you're done with the article, you'll have come some sort of a call to action that takes you to Quest where you might, you know, end up landing in Quest right away either ways. And Quest is really an application layer, a tech stack on top of which you can build different learn to earn curriculums. We have our own curriculums. They're called Academy Quests. It goes as follows. You can basically log in with your wallet. You learn about a variety of different topics. You then start your quest, which is a multiple choice question experience. If you successfully complete it, you get to claim a free proof of knowledge NFT. That NFT is your on-chain certification. It's non-transferable and its function is to prove knowledge, but its form could be anything. And that's the fun part. It could be metaverse wearable, it could be collectible, it could be an artwork, mm. it could be a message. So mm. what you're doing is that you are actually getting into the space, learning about it. You have an incentive, which is that certification, but that incentive could then be used in a variety of different other environments. So your certification could be a collectible that's a beanie that you're going to wear in the sandbox. And that if you wear that beanie in the sandbox, you're actually going to be able to unlock different levels of a game that if you hadn't done that education experience, you wouldn't have been able to access. So you're actually incentivizing people to learn and to experience Web3. And that's, you know, very interesting because then it's not only about passive education, it's about interactive education that leads you into the space in a variety of different ways. Another very interesting thing, and I'll finish on that, 
is that we have our own Academy quests, but Ledger Quest is also built for the community. So what we're doing today is that we're working with a variety of different partners, you know, namely Word of Women, Cool Cats, ApeCoin, Deathfellas, Lucidia, and some others that I can mention right now that we'll be announcing soon. And they've actually utilized our, our tech stack to build their own curriculums. These experiences are actually token gated to their holders. And for instance, in the case of Word of Women, uh, they, they were our launch partners and, you know, went great. We built a whole educational campaign around their quest starting with education workshops, Twitter spaces, co-creation of content, etc., to get their communities ready for the quest. Then the community ended up doing the quest, getting the proof of knowledge NFT. And if you had the proof of knowledge NFT, you could go to the token gated shop, Ledger's token gated shop, and claim a free custom Word of Woman Ledger. So it took you from, you know, learning to experiencing to getting your first digital asset, your first soul bound tokens at least, and then claiming a free device. Which is smart because I think most people won't just go and take a course on self-custody. Most people just don't get it. And so unless it's something you learned in school, you're probably not going to go spend your weekend learning about self-custody. Mainstream people, obviously many of us the listeners here do, just we care. But I think when you go past early adopters, I'm not going to care. And so you got to tie some sort of incentive to it. So I think it's super smart. And so instead of the call to action of go and pre-order your <laughs> the Academy and complete that, that's the new call to action. Today. Yeah, I mean, Academy Quests, we have about a couple that are currently online and then we'll have a full curriculum by the end of April. This is the basic track that we've currently developing, but then we'll have like more specialized tracks and like NFTs, DeFi, learning about like uh, specific topics. And we'll try as much as we can to uh, make it as gamified as possible. Whereas like if you complete two different tracks, you unlock different perks and uh, access like uh, products, services, experiences, whether they be IRL or in the metaverse. So education can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Great line. Okay. Before we wrap up, I just want to ask you a couple speed round questions, but I want to give you a chance. Is there anything else that you want to show or you want to tell people to direct their attention to? Uh, honestly, no, apart from, you know, just telling the people that are out there today during this bear market that this is an amazing opportunity for them to learn more and to experience the space in ways that a lot of people in the future are not going to be able to experience it. Chill, sit back, don't be stressed. I see a lot of stress in this space. I'm like people mm -hmm. very tense because obviously those are hard times, but I kind of like the bear market. To be honest, you get the time to think about the future. You get the time to strategize. Mm -hmm. It's also kind of washing away all of the fluffy stuff that they didn't belong here in the first place. All of the things that didn't really have a strong foundation. So it's a kind of a natural selection of the good stuff. So just stick around, learn, take your time and enjoy it. That's the main thing that I'd like to chill. I appreciate that. Everyone needs that. Okay. A few just quick questions that have some fun at the end here. Typically the question I ask is what's an NFT you'll never sell. But since you are so active in the ledger nft collection i want to flip that question and i want to ask you what's a new project that you guys have purchased or added to the collection and new is a relative term it could be in the last six months but something a project that you're excited about i'd have to say art blocks like we own a lot of different art blocks pieces and i think you know art blocks is such a fascinating project when people think about generative art in the future They'll think about the first outputs that were generated in the 50s and the 60s by people like Vera Molnar and Herbert Frank. And then they'll go directly to Artbox. Like Artbox will have a chapter in the art history book. And why? Because NFTs were mainly used as vehicles of distribution of different artworks rather than being the medium for the artistic creation itself, right? You had different artists taking their pictures, like photographers, illustrators, etc and then linking it to the token and selling that artwork via the token itself. Whereas with Artblocks, what's happening, and obviously Artblocks isn't the first generative art project. You had Larva Labs and Autoglyphs before, but I would say Artblocks is really what they can generative art to the next stage. The NFT itself is the media. So it's the code that's being written on the NFT that enables your screen or your browser to actually render that and for you to be able to see that the artwork. So in terms of like a massive shift and, um, you know, if you think of artistic mediums, you start with stone sculpture, then you end up with the canvas paintings, and then you go to, you know, photography. Basically, the camera wasn't really invented for art. It was invented for journalists, you know, and covering war. Then artists started creating art with it. And then if you think about code, 
code wasn't necessarily designed for artistic creation. But then if you think about all of these mediums, basically their premise wasn't to create art. But then artists started using these different mediums in order to express themselves creatively. Okay, I know you're a big electronic music fan, so I'm going to ask a non-Web3 question <laughs> here. Best concert you've seen recently or concert you're most excited for that's coming up? That's a very complicated question. Best concert I've seen recently or best concert that I'm very much looking forward to? So I don't really go to concerts. I'm more of a club type of person. I like clubs more than big concerts. It's more intimate, etc. Sure. And I really love what I... Amsterdam-based label has been doing recently. It's called VBX. Not very famous, but it's more like a 90s. So there are, like, to get back to something that we were saying earlier is like about how culture is actually, you know, being developed and then preserved with time. Recent labels have been doing is that they've been trying to preserve as much as they could the sound of the 90s. So the sound of the 90s is so interesting when you think about electronic music production for a variety of different reasons, mainly because few machines started to emerge. So we started hearing sounds that you couldn't hear before. But second is because everything had to be pressed. It wasn't digital. There wasn't abundance. There was scarcity in what you could hear. And today, with the abundance of digitization, the sounds are all kind of the same because it's all some sort of like a huge melting pot and then everything data driven so the radio stations only put the stuff that have worked before so this you kind of start hearing the same thing all over again and that's obviously impacted electronic music as well when i think of electronic music i'm more of an underground type of guy so like i don't think of david getter or martin garrix or whatever <laughs> for respect to, to these guys they've done great but anyways what I'm, I'm trying to kind of explain here is that these labels do vinyl only sets and the djs they come with their vinyls and these vinyls have in the 90s or at least some of them are produced today but with an inspiration from the sound of the 90s and i think that's super inspiring and i draw a lot of parallels between generative art and electronic music like you think about it they're both dialogues between humans and machines that lead to unexpected creative outcomes both of them are pretty underground in the generative art space as an artist you don't necessarily have to dox yourself you can be whoever you want you can your identity there's this community-based culture and, and values and it's kind of same in the electronic music space like you know there are no like biases that are um, linked to who you are as a person and then it's just fun it's kind of you know exploring what technology and culture can do together it was a great answer much better than my question you took that in a great direction okay last one much linked the two questions together yeah great. Incredible. <laughs> incredible if you had a billboard that one billion people were going to see what would you write on it wow if I have to take a couple of seconds to think about this. I would just write something that would connect all of these people together. I think today we, we're not empathetic enough. I would write empathy on it. Everyone's stuck in their own journey and being the protagonist of their own life and, and movie. And when you kind of take a step back and you think about why we're here in the first place, you know, we don't even know where we're here in the first place on the planet. And humanity and what is the cosmos and homo sapiens have been there for 150,000 years the planet has been there for billions of years so we're basically a second in the life of a planet and then when you put that into perspective you kind of realize that the only important thing in this life or at least most people when they get old and when you kind of start visualizing how what you're going to be thinking about when you're basically at the last moments of your life is going to be the connections and people that you met and how you were as a person and not how much money you made or the house that you have or the, the car or whatever. You know, I'm not saying that these are things that you shouldn't really try to accomplish in terms of like the things that make you happy. I and mean, I'm not saying that a Lamborghini wouldn't make you happy, but I'm just saying that we need a little bit more empathy. So I think the human connections and understanding how to keep developing that in a digital world and in a world where technology is progressing so rapidly is really, really important beautiful finish. I love that you took that path to it. It's a, a wonderful message for everybody. Mo, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for the time. Right. Thanks to you and the whole team at Ledger for everything you guys are doing for the space. Deep bow. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Great conversation, guys. I'm happy to do this anytime in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening in, everybody. Have yourself a great week. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. And if it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.